Well, good afternoon. Good to see you all here. I've never, um, I've never been here before, and it's been a bit of a revelation what the Middle West looks like if you go just a little further east and a little further north from Kansas, <laughs> where I grew up. You guys have more trees. You got more water. Um, I am retired. I've been retired for years, except evidently I don't know how to do a very good job of that. I was talking to my sister and the driver uh, on the way here today. Uh, she's telling me that now she's retired. I said, oh, you'll love it. I'm retired. I've been retired forever. She said, you're not retired. <laughs> they all think I, I'm still working. I told her, this is not work. This is fun. OK. Where are we? I got my clicker. By the way, before, before we begin, so I don't forget, and then you'll come up later and say, who was that old guy in the first slide? That's me in disguise. I was chief of disguise at CIA. That's where I ended up. Certainly isn't where I began. I was just sitting with Addison, and she said, well, where did you begin? How did you, how did you join the CIA? Uh, I'll make it very, very fast. I was in Europe. My best friend back in Kansas got married in Germany. I was in her wedding. They went on a honeymoon. I decided not to go back to Wichita, Kansas. Um, I got a job. I called all these banks in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, the third bank I called, they asked me four questions and they hired me on the phone. You want to know the questions? They said, oh, you're looking for a job. Do you speak German? I said, no. They said, have you ever worked in a bank before? I said, no. What was the next question? It was a note. Did I have a work permit, which was required in Germany? No. They said, well, come on down and talk to us, and they hired me. <laughs> That's what started everything. And oddly, I'm, I'm a board member at the International Spy Museum back in Washington, DC. If any of you get there, go see it. It's, it's just, it's really cool. But I spoke to a group there two weeks ago, and guess what? It was J.P. Morgan Chase Manhattan Bank. And I got to thank them all these years later for starting uh, me on my career. Anyway, uh, I met some young Americans there. We, um, we had a really wonderful time going to Switzerland, going to France. I married one of them a year and a half later. He told me three days before the wedding that he wasn't really a civilian working with the military that he worked for the CIA. And I was like, I was 21, and I was like, that's OK. Yeah, OK. <laughs> he worked for the CIA. And they hired me as a secretary. And I was a secretary for a while. Uh, I was a very good secretary. I ended up being the secretary for the director of the office. And I was, I was bored. So I told my boss I, I was going to go to work to the, at the Smithsonian. I was going to talk to them. And he said, no, no, no. He said, we'll give you some photo lessons. And off we went. So I have to tell you where I worked at the CIA, where I was for those 27 years, starting as a contract wife, ending up as the chief of disguise, which is a really very cool job. Um, we were the cue to CIA, just like in the James Bond movies. We were composed of chemists mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, physicists, specialists in optics, specialists in, in, in ink, state-of-the-art technologies. We were inventing them. If the, if the thing that our officer needed for his operation didn't exist yet, we would invent it for him. It was a really exciting place to work. Um, and I stayed there my entire career, oddly, is it odd today? Everyone at CIA stayed there. People didn't just pop in and pop out. So today, when I meet someone that says, I just met someone, she said I was there for six years. And I meet her, and I'm looking at her thinking, what went wrong? You're supposed to be there for your career. Uh, I still don't know what went wrong. It's OK. <clears throat> My husband, Tony Mendez, by the way, he of Argo fame. Did anybody see Argo? Yeah. CIA loved Argo. They did. It's the only good movie that's ever been made about them. 
But just for, for clarification, my husband uh, was out in Denver, Colorado when he saw an ad in the, um, in the Denver Post, wanted to work overseas for the U.S. Navy, an artist to work overseas for the U.S. Navy. So he applied, and he ended up in Washington, D.C., uh, showing him, putting his, his work product out uh, so they could judge his uh, skills, and they hired him. And he had been thinking the whole time, what in the world do they want with an artist? What's an artist going to do with the CIA? <clears throat> well, they don't like to say that they're looking for a counterfeit or a forger. <laughs> but that's what they hired him for, to do counterfeiting and forgeries, because it's a necessary piece of the work. Tony was really good at it. He was so good at it that we, we bumped into it a couple of times. Uh, once, I remember, we were, we were at the airport. We were going to France. We had our young son with us. We were in the Air France line. We get to the front. The Frenchman across the counter was not a likable Frenchman. He was an arrogant Frenchman. He looked at you like, mm, I don't know. We didn't like it a lot. <clears throat> Maybe he felt that. So he picked up Tony's passport, and he held it like it was dirty. And he said, she is expired. She is expired. His passport, my husband, the head of all documents for CIA, is at Dulles Airport with his passport, and it's expired. And I'm over, I'm over in the corner with a pile of luggage and my son. I'm trapped. I can't do a thing, which is hard for me. And he said, OK. He said, five minutes in the men's room. I can fix this. <laughs> And I, I, the voice of reason, I said, but you know, now it would be a felony. <laughs> so we went down to K Street, we got him a new passport overnight, and off we went to France. Uh, he also, I'm going way off script here, he also <laughs> told me he was going to give a course at the uh, International Spy Museum on forgeries, on counterfeiting. And I said, why would you do that? You're going to teach people how to? He said, absolutely. He said, I see it like a Julia Child. There's a mirror above me. I'm at a desk. They can all, you know, they can see what I'm doing, and I'll show them how it works. And I said, you know, I, I just thought it was the stupidest thing. He taught a room full of people to forge Vladimir Putin's signature. <laughs> and to pass the course, you had to bring it up and show it to him. He'd initial it. And he'd say, go make good trouble. Good, go make mischief. Go do something fun with that. OK, we're going to go back to the script. We were, we, were, uh, we were the gadget people at CIA. If you needed to bug a place, if you needed an audio bug, if you needed a counterfeit document, if you needed, let me think of some other things. Well, if you needed disguises, you would come and see me. If you needed a concealed camera early in my career, you would come and see me. No matter what it was you were thinking about, if you needed it for your operation, you'd swing by our office and our engineers. That half of us that invented and built machinery and things, they would help you. My half would go overseas with you. We'd go with you. Because unlike those silly James Bond movies, we didn't trust James worth a nickel. <laughs> he would. Lose it, he would break it, he would forget how it worked, he'd leave it on the metro. We went with our $2 million piece of equipment and make sure, made sure that it worked and that he gave it back to us when it was all over. So that was half of the fun. And I, I used to tell Tony, don't tell them it's fun because it doesn't sound serious. It was fun doing some of this work. The work was overseas. All the work was overseas. Never forget. We were working overseas, collecting the information on the plans and intentions of this country's enemies. Full stop. That's the job. What are they going to do? We had satellite programs up there that could tell us the status quo at any given moment. Um, we had a lot of ways that we could monitor what was happening right now. We knew that. We wanted to know, what are they going to do next? What are they planning? That's what we were out there looking for. We were looking for people who had access to that information and trying to figure out how to get close enough to those people 
how to befriend them, how to help them, whatever you had to do to get them to tell you what you needed to know. So if you can only imagine some foreign person sidles up to you in a bar somewhere and says, listen, I know you work over here and I'd really, really love to have your help about this or that. It would ask you to betray your country. There's not a person in this room that would go along with that. So we never did it that way, but we had to get the information somehow from these people, whether they realized or not that we were collecting. Here we go with the technical stuff. Let's see if it works. This was one of my programs. This is called a tropel, um, the tropel pin, and inside the pin is a camera. In the, in the upper left-hand corner, that smallest cylinder is the camera, and the camera inside of the cylinder is a cartridge, like the uh, old Kodak yellow film cartridge, but this is so much smaller, and inside the cartridge is the tiniest piece of film you ever saw. It's about that long. You could take 100 pictures with that camera. That camera was one of the most lethal weapons we had during the Cold War. We didn't give just anybody that camera, but if we had an agent who had access to the tippy top of wherever it was, whatever it was we were looking for, we give him the camera. So he could be standing at Putin's desk, making notes, Putin's talking, Putin turns his head, talking to someone else, our guy, can just flip the pen silently with one finger, take a picture, Putin turns back, flip the camera, make another note, put the pen in your pocket, and go to lunch with him. We collected so much intelligence with this one tool. But it was kind of heart-stopping to develop the film. Every time I developed that film, I thought, you know, someone in the world risked their life to take the, these images. I cannot, I cannot screw this up. Every time you did it, it was like you were starting over. You can't screw it up. Don't mess up the film. This is the KGB's kind of answer to that. This is a KGB coat, has six buttons, and in one of the buttons, the one there in the middle, is a camera. And what he's holding in his hand is the actuator for that camera. It would normally be in his pocket you wouldn't know the camera was there, you wouldn't know the actuator was there, and he'd walk down the street toward you. He'd be taking your picture the whole time he's walking toward you. KGB was um, trying to do the same thing we were, just from the flip side of things. Um, this is the kind of thing we did. This is, uh, this is a one-time pad. If you've ever heard of an Enigma machine during World War II, yeah. the, Ger the German Enigma machine it was based on a one-time pad. It was an encrypted device that was unbreakable, absolutely unbreakable. And at the Spy Museum, up on the wall, they have posted a number. It's one number of the, the possible number of settings for the Enigma machine. And you can't even say it in words. You have to see this number. You can't. There, there are no words for it. And that was true. It was unbreakable. As long as the German only used the one-time pad one time. So during World War II, I don't know if you knew this, but the Poles found a crack in that system, and a German used the one-time pad twice, and that's all it took. The Polish intelligence service broke the Enigma code during the Second World War and gave the Allies, of course, the result. And so we were able to see the German traffic, the submarine traffic, the traffic on the ground. Winston Churchill knew where they were gonna bomb. He knew who was in danger. He knew which cathedral in, in, in England was gonna be bombed next. But they couldn't, they couldn't react to it. They couldn't say, get out of the way. Something bad is coming tomorrow. Poor Winston Churchill, on top of everything else, had to sit on this information for the duration of the war. We use the one-time pads. It's concealed in a fake, it's not a fake walnut, it's just an empty walnut. We used one-time pads for a lot of the small devices that we would issue to our agents where we couldn't meet with them face-to-face. -face. Maybe it was too dangerous. So they could communicate with us um, electronically. Uh, this is Moscow. This was a, a device where we could 
tell if the Russians were following us. It was a receiver. It's kind of like what the uh, Secret Service uses with the president today. But instead of having that cable, or like a water hose coming out of your ear, where everybody knows Secret Service, Secret Service, we had something called a phonac. It's made by, by the Swiss. It's a little tiny thing. It's inside of that circle. Put the phonac in your ear, 